Come on, it's good to be in the house of God, amen? Uh, it's, it's, uh, I get to say to you, Happy New Year for the first time this year. Blessed New Year to you. And can we give a big, big hand to Redemption Church joining us right now? Hey, Greenstone, uh, Redemption Church in the Netherlands, we love you. And to all the people joining us on TBN, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are, I know you're going to be blessed. You are going to just love today's word from the Lord, but it is, it is an honor and privilege to have you with us today. Amen. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be in the house of God. And uh, um, myself and Tara have just come back from a, a little bit of uh, rest um, and just kind of looking ahead into the year, and we are excited for what God is going to do not just in our lives, but in your lives. And you need to know that God recognizes and knows the plans of the devil, okay? Even, even Jesus says, right? <laughs> the sign of the times. There's gonna be this, 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 that, this. But do not worry. For I have overcome the world. In the world, a lot of things are going to go on. But do not worry. And when Jesus looks at what is going on on the earth and its challenges, its problems, and the evil agenda that is happening, and the attack, and you know, the, the devil, we know what he comes to do, to kill, steal, and to destroy Okay, so wherever you see, see killing, stealing, lying, and destruction, it's not God, right? It is the devil's agenda. But you need to know when Jesus sees that agenda, he doesn't determine that the answer is that he sends himself and angels whilst we are set aside and he fights that battle. No, he fights that battle through his church in the world. That is why in scripture, the church is called the hope, the hope for the world. So make no mistake, being connected to the church of Jesus Christ is the best place you can be in for God to do a significant work in and through you in this world, right? You are under the assignment of the ultimate overcomer. And therefore you see yourself facing challenges with Jesus. And when Jesus is facing your challenges with you, you overcome them. It does not say I am strong. It says when I am weak, he is strong. And so I wanna tell you, be very, very intentional with your walk with the Lord and with the purpose of which God has placed you on this earth. You are not here to, to exist in a bubble and hide and survive and build a bunker under your house with power and water. You are here to thrive in this world, okay? And so by being in his church, in the bride of Christ, right, you are attached to an assignment that is overcoming, victorious, full of his glory. And in such a time as this, you are not alive by mistake today. You are alive by design and intention. And you, not just the pastors, you are anointed. You are equipped, you are positioned, irrespective of your age and, your, and what you've gone through and what you failed at. In fact, I wanna tell you something that's gonna encourage you today. When the world wants to assess you, they ask you for your CV to see if you're good enough to follow, to back, to believing. The world looks at what you've done but when God asks us to assess ourselves, he asks us to look not where we've been, but where we are going. 
If you want to understand someone in your life, spiritually, don't look at what they've been through. Look at where God is taking them. Look at where God is leading them. We're not assessed by where we come from. We are assessed by where he's taking us to. And so the beauty of this story is, however you show up in this year and wherever you are positioned and whatever you face, that is what the enemy wants you to focus on. But today you're gonna hear what God wants you to focus on. And I believe, I believe with all my heart, this will be your best year yet, right? But let me make a comma there. If it's your best year spiritually, it's not about the things and the stuff and the accomplishments and the CV and the natural things of this earth. But if we would put our heart, our eyes, our focus intentionally on his kingdom, his righteousness, his word, his bride, and we would function from that. If it's our best year spiritually, oh, it's irrelevant what goes on around you. It will be your best year yet. Amen. Amen. We believe that. Today, I want to speak to you from the thought back to base camp. Can you say this with me? Say back to base camp. Right? Redemption, I know that I'm talking to you through technology, but it's not good enough to avoid this. I'm going to say it one more time, and I want everyone in Greenstone to say this too, right? What I want you to say, back to base camp. Say it again. Back to base camp. We're starting the year, this year, this is not our word for the year, but God has given us a setup to take us towards the year for the year and the vision to position us correctly. And in fact, for the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at how God wants to position us. Next week, I'm starting a series on Psalm 91 that is gonna bless your socks off. But we wanna position you, right? Because thousands fall here and tens of thousands there. And there's all kinds of attack. When you're sleeping, there's attack. When you're awake, there's attack. There's attack at the front, attack at the rear, attack from your enemy, attack from your best friend. All right? But God wants you to position yourself in the secret place. And so before we get to the unfolding of what God is speaking to us prophetically, I want to position you this year because it's all about recognizing what is the sign and the signature of God working in your life. And today is gonna to encourage you greatly. If you've gotten to 2023 and you've showed up here and you're like, I'm at square one, right? That's not the devil. God is doing a work in your life. And you're gonna see that today. Back to base camp. Every single person here has a call and a and a purpose and a plan that God has placed on your life. And we recognize that that plan is to go from glory to glory. It's to go from level to level. And I'm not just talking about, glory is not just in things. All right? Because if that was glory, we would look at the world having things and we would see glory, but we don't. We see people possessing things, but still living in dysfunction and destruction. We see people ending their lives, yet they had everything we thought they would need to be happy. A family, money, a career. We see people giving up hope, but the truth is they've pursued empty things. They have climbed a mountain set in front of them by, by the devil saying, if you reach those objectives, those tasks, those, those, uh, those uh, you know, uh, achievements, if you are promoted from here to here, then you will be happy, no. But God has a plan for your life, for you to grow from glory to glory, right? And to see your life have the signature of God's hand. Yet we find ourselves often feeling like, where is God? Where is God? Look at what I face. Look at what's going on. Where is God? And today, as I speak to you about back to base camp, I'm gonna show you that be encouraged because the Lord is working. The Lord is working. All right, so we're gonna jump straight into our text for today. First Peter chapter five. Now, some of you might say, but pastor, the context of this, 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 this writing and the scripture is to leadership. And it is 100%. But can I just say this today? We are also, we are also in a time on this earth where we cannot look at only the employees of a church as the leadership. 
That's not scriptural, right? Yes, we have leadership structures, but let me say this. You are the leader in many people's life. I am not. You are the leader in your life. You are the leader in your home, right? You are the leader that Jesus has positioned in your workplace. I, I, pff, me? Lead? Yes, you. If the early church only had, only had a handful, 12 leaders, and everyone else was a member, we would not have the early church. Okay? And so we submit to one another in our giftings and our callings, but make no mistake, every single person who calls Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior has a leadership assignment on their lives that people would look at them and say, where are you going? Because I want to go with you. If the Lord Jesus is leading you, your good shepherd, your life looks divinely inspired to the world. I'm not talking about you're humming all day, right? And you're weird and you're having trips. No, the world looks at your life and says, how do you function? And they would say it with such peace, such, and it's actually the fruit of the spirit. But the way you function, they say, whatever you are taking, sniffing, snorting, reading, injecting, where can I get it? And they follow you without recognizing, right? You're following the good shepherd, okay? So every single person in redemption, in Greenstone, in Holland, in Hungary, in Germany, here, Rhema, Randberg, every single person, God has a leadership assignment on your life the children in your life, the friends in your life. You have a leadership assignment on your life. So I'm putting you in this text to show you what God wants you to do as a leader and what it feels like for the good shepherd to be leading you. Amen. So first Peter chapter five, let's go to verse two. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So let me stop there. This church that Tara and I lead will never go where we're not prepared to go. Your family will never go where you're not prepared to go. Leadership is about letting the Lord work with you first. How quick are we to tell people what to do but that only carries weight when people recognize you have done that. Come on now. If, if someone is struggling radically with their weight, how many of you know few people might assign themselves to that person as their personal trainer? Because they would say, and that person could possess all the knowledge and possibly be the best personal trainer in the world, but the assessment we have is if you do not possess it, how can you give it to me? All right? So this is a word I, I'm preaching to myself today, all right? Not at you, to me, for your benefit. Praise the Lord, okay, right? And when the chief shepherd appears, so make no mistake, we might be shepherds, but we're not the chief shepherd. As shepherds, we need to recognize we have a chief shepherd, and we need to Always be reliant on the chief shepherd. Truthfully, I cannot lead any church in my flesh. I cannot lead my family. I cannot lead myself. I cannot lead our dog. Anyway. The truth is, I can only lead as much as I am prepared to be led. So what is most important in my life is that I am conscious, is this where the Lord is leading me? And I have to say this, you need to recognize that it is our priority as the leadership to be led by the Lord, not by the fears of men, the opinions of people, the prejudice of people. We have to be led by the good shepherd because we do not want earthly results. We want heavenly results. We want divine results. We want, to see, we want to see God do what only he can do. 
And so we can only lead in accordance to how. So you might say, I'm a leader. Well, the truth is, you can only lead in direct proportion to how prepared you are to be led. Okay? So it says, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For, and he quotes, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Many of you have maybe heard this mentioned, this scripture spoken about, but today I want to show you what it is to be proud, and what it is to be humble. Because this needs to be taught and revealed to you in such a way that you get it. Because if you get it, grace will flow in your life. And when grace flows in your life, God elevates you. Promotion is on the other side of receiving more grace. Now, some of you are already thinking, oh, here we go. He's gonna bash me today now. Right? Why? Because every single one of us have a flesh. And it says there, God resists the proud. Now, the Greek there does not say God banishes the proud. God does not look at your life and see you carrying pride. Now, pride shows up in many different ways. It's written in the New Testament under the word ego or I. That not I, but Christ would rise, would reign. Your flesh loves to say I, me, my. What I want, what I don't have, what's unfair, what I fear is pride. I, I'm so scared that if I'm not in control, that will happen, this will happen. That, but here's the thing, God does not say I banish you. God is not throwing you away. Because sometimes we say when you have pride, God resists you. No, the Greek there is this. Have you ever looked, let me give you a picture. Have you ever had two batteries? I mean, we all try this in school and they have a positive and a negative charge, all right? And if you take them literally in their original format and you try to put the two positive ends together, you cannot get them to touch because the positives push against each other and they repel each other. Now, when God says, I resist the proud, the picture there is pride is the I who refuses to follow the leading of the chief shepherd. So God puts a path in front of you, right? And you say, no thanks, I'm going that way. If we stand back from the scenario, what we see is one party walking this way and another party going this way. God says, I want to lead you. I want to guide you. I want to shepherd you. I want to take you into the future for the plans I have for you are to prosper you, not to bring harm to you. Like Tara mentioned, the blessing I have for you doesn't come with sorrow. Yeah, but if I just have that promotion, if I just have that car, if I just have that debt settled, no, 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 it's not about that. I'm leading you to a place where irrespective of this, you're gonna have what you thought that would give you, okay? So pride says, well, Jesus, you're going in a direction my flesh just doesn't like. That's not an answer. God, what are we gonna do about the people who conspire against me, talk about me, gossip about me? Well, we're gonna love them. We're gonna pray for them. We're gonna bless them. Well, that just doesn't seem to be what I agree with right here, right now. So I am gonna get super bitter and angry and I'm gonna plot my revenge, right? You are technically going in the different direction to the good shepherd, okay? So it is not that God is resisting you, it is that you are choosing to take a path by your flesh where you are your own shepherd. A shepherd's responsibility is to lead and guide and navigate from point A to point B. 
safely, securely, restfully. Oh, you know, when you lead me, it feels like I'm by still waters. But here's the bottom line. You wake up on Monday morning, you listen to that news. You're not by still waters, you're by raging rapids. And within 20 minutes, this year, this year, you will not possess a, a being led spirit if you are giving your ear and your eye in predominant time to what the world has to say, to what people have to say, to what plots are being made, to what things are going on. That is not going to lead you and guide you. This word of God is the only way that you meditate on his word, you hear his voice, you know his voice, and then you can recognize the imposter's voice. My sheep know my voice. You know what's interesting why we call sheep? Sheep cannot see further than a few feet in front of them. They have to be led by what they hear. They can't see the future. Pastor, what do we think in the next three years? I can't tell you. I can tell you that you need daily bread and you need the Lord to lead you daily. You need to wake up and go, Lord, Lord I'm going to your word. Now, this is the hardest thing to do because this is where spiritual battles are fought and won. Because when you wake up and you listen to the news, my goodness, you show up at work and you are anxious, stressed. That boss doesn't like me. This is going on. You, you, you are immediately functioning and flowing from ego. Right? But the good shepherd wants to lead you. So God is not saying, I resist you. It's actually saying we repel each other because you are going in the direction away from where I am leading you. Okay? So pride says, I'm not doing it God's way. It's the bottom line. I'm not, huh. and now we recognize it in our lives. But that's good, that's great, because now you don't identify as I'm a failure, you just say my flesh wants me to fail, right? The voice in the garden, Adam and Eve. Ah, if you just do what God told you not to do, you'll be like him, right? That's the flesh, the I wanna know, I, I wanna control, I, want to understand. In your relationships, in your marriages, when you look at what God asks of us, it kills I. Kills it. Husbands, die for your wives. Serve them like Jesus served. What? My wife is meant to serve. Mm -hmm. I. Oh. The ego. Right? Right? It's about dealing with the I because the I always moves in the opposite direction of where Jesus is taking you. And when Jesus wants to take you, it's from glory to glory. It's to grow in the knowledge of his incredible peace, wisdom, and power, right? And so what's fascinating is the next verse then says, what does it say? But God gives grace to the humble. So now we know that pride just says, not interested in your word, Lord. I've got a better way. But grace comes to those who are humble. Then it says, therefore, okay, because we have the spiritual truth, what is therefore our action? What is next for us to do then to receive grace? It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So God's idea for you is to promote you. Not just in work, but as a person to grow, to mature. You, your age does not determine your maturity. Oh, you can be you can be seventy and behave like a five-year-old, right? And you can be twenty-one and walk. You can Jesus at twelve is literally teaching the rabbis a few things, right? In fact, it's quite ironic that. God is like, hey, let me tell you something. This is only spiritual maturity. It only comes through a spiritual process of submitting to the good shepherd. All right? So here's the thing. I want grace, but here's the problem. We think when God says, humble yourselves under my mighty hand, he means something. I'm gonna ask Pastor Cabela to come up here quick on the stage. The fittest, best looking dude around. All right? All right. I want you, um, Pastor Cabello, to get down on your knees, right? Yeah, I'll face that way, it's fine. Or we can have an exchange there, okay? Cower down 
and like be in a position of defeat and, and looking up to me, like you're scared of me, right? We think being under the hand of God looks like this, right? I'm humbling myself because God is, un he is literally pushing me down. Get lower and lower and lower and lower. Humble yourself, failure, mess, right? That's not what the Greek says. The word there is humble yourself under the mighty hand of God speaks of this. You can change your posture. Based on positional geography, technically, if my hand is like this to him, is he under my hand? Right? Ge geographically, he is. He's under me. He's not over my hand. Right? But my hand is extended with a purpose. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That word under is not just the word positionally below. It also has the Greek meaning with, together with. It means God extends his hand when you are at your lowest because I ruins everything. I ruins everything. If you live by I, you walk in a path of destruction being led by the devil. When you do not follow the Lord, you follow the flesh, and the flesh only has one ending. Kill, steal, destroy. I positions you where you're nowhere. You're low. But humility is changing your perspective. Looking up to God whose hand is extended towards you. That under, together with his mighty hand. How can I tell you this in context? What is the very next verse? Humble yourself under his hand in Greek, together with his hand, right? So that in due time, Amen. he will raise you up. Amen. It is not God shaming you. It is God delivering you. Humility says, I can't do this on my own. And it looks up and it sees the hand of the good shepherd saying, now in humility, which is recognizing I cannot, but he can. Amen. All right? Amen. He, with his hand, let's read this next verse together. It does what? He exalts you in due time. How does it feel? Can you go down there again? When he's there, which is where all of us are, and I would argue in any area of our life, we can be there on a daily basis. All right? When we are there, we recognize we're at our lowest because we're being fleshly. <laughs> Paul says, let me, let me let you all in on what I face as the most effective apostle alive on the earth who labors more than all of you. I face weakness in myself to the degree that the good I wanna do, I don't do, and the bad I don't wanna do, I practice. God, can you kill me now? Because this flesh is super hard to deal with. He gets to that place, right? He gets to that place and then he says, the Holy Spirit shows up, therefore now, there is no condemnation. So the hand of God extended towards you is not this, it's this, right? And humility grabs onto the good shepherd's hand to be led, okay? Now, how does it feel? The verse gives us context. It says, casting all your cares upon him. Humility is the revelation and the sensation, I've got burdens, but I'm giving them to the Lord. I've got cares. This is where I feel. This is where I'm at. This is what my flesh wants to do. This is what is unfair, is unjust, is unright. But actually, I need the Lord. God, work in my life. Save me, lead me. Lead me out of this. And what's the first thing he does? As he lifts you, you are giving him your burdens. 
in the world, in the world you will have every bad thing you could ever imagine. But do not worry, for I have overcome the world. Worry, worry, panic, shame, anxiety, all these things are the fruit of the flesh. And when we're down there, humility is not, I'm so bad. Humility is, he has an extended hand to lead me and guide me. And I just hold on to that hand. And the good shepherd takes me, takes me from place to place. Now, thanks, bro. Sure. I want to tell you something. <laughs> Casting your cares on the Lord. Casting your cares. When you see someone who walks around what you would call humility, they look like someone who just doesn't react to the world. You can be mean to them, it doesn't change the way they behave. You can plot and it and doesn't change. And you can hear terrible news and they don't jump on it with a gossip and a cynical view. Well, let's pray, let's trust, let's serve. Why? Because they understand that there's cares and there's burdens, but that's not theirs to carry. Whenever I function out of my flesh, I comes out, I, I, I. Well, I don't think, I don't know, I can't, I can't. And that is exactly the point of why Jesus came, to be your savior. When Peter walks on the water towards Christ, the moment he takes his eyes off Jesus, he sinks. And Jesus comes, hey, eyes off of Jesus, looks at the waves and the wind, sinking. Looks at the news and the world and the economies and the politics. Eyes on Jesus. And the beauty is, when you start sinking, God doesn't go, see, I told you we're gonna drown. Told you, if you take your eyes off me, you're done. He says, I know you're going to drown if you take your eyes off me. That's why I come to you and I extend my hand. You are under my hand. <laughs> but humility is grabbing onto that hand of grace. Of grace. Grabbing onto the hand that gives you grace. That extends you what you can't earn. What you can't take. And then the next verses we need to pay attention to as well. Be sober, be vigilant, verse eight, because the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Notice that in the devil's works, how he moves is this. He roars. Does that the devil walks around stabbing you? He says he walks around roaring. Wow, there's a lot of roaring mouths right now. Oh, to steal that peace and that joy. Right? That's how the devil functions based on what you hear. Right? What you read, what you bring in, what speaks to you is meant to derail you from going, there's no God, I can't do this. And though you're down and you're low, you are not seeing the hand of grace extended to you. Right? But he says in verse 10, may the God of all grace, who called us to enter his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, this process perfects, establishes, strengthens, and settles you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Yes, there is suffering in this world, but God has extended a hand of grace to you that your pride says, I'm not, I'm not going there. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. And as long as you do this, you stay there. Look at how Jesus walked around. The woman caught in her sin of adultery. She's there. And what is the Pharisees doing? Judging her, wanting to stone her. <laughs> and Jesus shows up and technically she's under his hand. But what does he show up with grace? I'm the only one who can judge her and destroy her, but I'm the one who chooses not to because I will take her judgment on my shoulders. And what I extend to her in this moment is, is she prepared to take my hand and be saved by grace, right? Climbing Mount Everest is seen to be the most significant physical achievement a person can possibly do while alive on the earth. It has everything going against you. Not just the actual activity, but the weather. Not just the activity and the weather, but 
the lack of chance because ice breaks when it breaks, right? And then you're climbing with a group of people who might, it's the hardest thing to get right. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have tried and many have died and most have failed. But when you get to Mount Everest, you get assigned a Sherpa, a shepherd. And the purpose of the Sherpa is to get you to the summit, to the top. They are paid by you to climb that mountain with you to get you to the top. And they've done it many, 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 many times. I don't know the exact amount, but quite a few Sherpas have done it multiple dozens of times. And so it's interesting that the objective is we are going to the top. But I'm doing this for the first time. I have no idea what I'm doing. You've done this many times. I'm paying you and I'm trusting you to get me to the top. That's what the shepherd's responsibility is. God's whole plan for your life is to take you to the top. And I'm not talking about I'm the CEO. I'm talking about when the world looks at you, you possess what they cannot buy. Right? Right? In scripture, the world took everything it could away from the early church and yet went, the more we persecute you, the more you rise in faith and love and grace. We want what you, we cannot take it away. What is it? And the church explodes. Not because they have the stuff, because they have the things that the world cannot get through the stuff. Okay, what good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? God wants you to have soul prosperity. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to the top of Mount Everest. Accept it, let's go. Well, there's a place called Base Camp. Your starting point down here. Many camps away from the summit. Right, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, camp five, right? Many camps between base and the summit. And the Sherpa's responsibility, the good, the best shepherd will get you to the top healthy, strong, and safe, right? The good shepherd, right? In fact, those shepherds will give their lives. They'll die with you if you fail. Matters, right? What's interesting is, we all think the way we climb Mount Everest is we go to base camp, we get our shepherd, we've got our tanks, we've got our food, we've got our excitement, we've got our energy, and we climb from base camp to camp one. And then we rest a few days, we stay there at camp one, and then we go from camp one to camp two, climbing higher and higher, higher and higher, level to level, glory to glory, camp three to camp four to camp five, come on, and finally we get to the summit. That is not how you climb Mount Everest. You start at base camp and you climb up to camp one. You spend a few days there and your body acclimatizes. And then the shepherd says, we can't stay here long because your body is now starting to suffer. I have to take you back to base camp. And at base camp, you will recover your rest, recover your body, and you'll get strong again and you'll get ready again. And then when we're ready to go at base camp, we will then climb up to camp one, past camp one, to camp number two. And we'll spend a few days there trying to acclimatize, getting our body used to what this is like. And then we have to go back. Yeah, well, let's go back to camp one. No, camp one will kill you. It's not there for you. It's not what we, we have to go all the way back to base camp. Listen, yeah, shepherd, you suck. Because it seems like in order for me to go high, I have to keep going back to base camp. This is not what I signed up for. Don't like this. Right? No, I know. But you want to get to the top, don't you? Yes, but my way. Well, it's not going to work. Because the body cannot survive going from one altitude to the higher, to the higher, to the higher without having recovery and rest. Now, when the Lord is leading you, the flesh hates it because it feels like I'm back to base camp. When Paul writes about his spiritual maturity, he doesn't look at me, I've made it. He says, the more I make it, the more I've got to work through. <laughs> the more aware of myself I become, Wow, that's the flesh. That jumped up. Jeez, I thought I dealt with that at 27. I thought I dealt with that at 32, right? And the reality is the good shepherd always leads you back to a place of rest, reflection, and recovery. And <laughs> says, we're going to summit, but the way to the top is to consistently return to base camp to consistently come back to the basics, to consistently come back to a place of rest. <laughs> Base camp believers 
are the people, the someones who summit. The believers that fall astray are the ones that just push to the next level, push to the next level. And they say, well, the shepherd's going back, but I've got to get to the top. I don't have time for this. Do you notice what it says there? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Grab up onto his hand that in due time. Can I tell you what that feels like in my life? I desire something. It doesn't happen. Because my identity is in it. And the moment I give up on it, God brings it. But I don't want that. It comes with all the things. I thought it came with these things, right? Like, you're like, I'm single. I just want to get married. Because when I get married, I'm going to get breakfast in bed every day. I'm going to get all these things. I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to get. Then you get married and you go, sure. Uh, I, I, I don't know what this is, but I thought I was a much better person than what I'm getting told I am. Right? <laughs> Okay, Lord, there's a lot of flesh here that we've got to work through. My goodness, I thought marriage was about me. It is. It's not comfortable for the flesh. But when we start to do things God's way, it comes alive. You know? But the way up is down. To exalt yourself, don't exalt yourself. Humble yourself. I'll trust the Lord. Aren't you going to take it for yourself? Aren't you going to do it for yourself? No, that's I. Right? Oh, well, now I'm married. We have kids. It's going to make everything amazing kids come along, right? All you get from kids is demand, no supply, <laughs> right? You're like, my goodness. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? Promotion in immaturity looks like it's gonna solve the issue here. But the truth is God says, we gotta solve this first. So when promotion comes, it doesn't kill you. I gotta build a godly character in you at base camp so that you can get to camp three. This is the exact opposite of the world's teaching. The way you evolve is you take. The way you increase in promotion is you stand on everyone. The way you protect your position is you divide and conquer. You trust no one. You raise no one. But the church is meant to be raising and empowering and equipping. I, I pray that there are thousands of people more gifted that come through this ministry than I. Because I cannot save and deliver anyone. But this vessel empty, looking at the Lord going, lead me and guide me, trusting him, right? Doing life with him, right? Then we can accomplish much, but it's not me accomplishing anything. It's him accomplishing things through me. And the thing is, what's interesting is, in the Old Testament, worship looks like this. I am here and I do this. And God is here and he does this. When Abraham and Melchizedek are having an exchange, Abraham says to the king of Sodom, who says, hey, just give me the people. I'll give you all the riches in the world. Because the devil's after people, by the way. The devil doesn't care how big our building is. It's, is, is, is it full of people finding Jesus? He, he doesn't care about what I look like. It's am I being effective in leading people to Jesus, right? The devil's interested in people, not stuff. He'll give you all the stuff in the world if he can distract you from your godly given purpose. For some of you, this year is about giving away more responsibility at your work, laying down some stuff, getting, getting healthy, getting strong, making space for God in your day. Oh, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. How much of your time do you trust the Lord with in your day? So look at Abraham. He's got riches. And Sodom comes and says, give me the people. And Abraham says, I have raised my hand in worship. I have put my hand up to grab onto the hand of God. From my place with this lowly stuff, I'm raising it up and going, Lord, I worship you with it. I'm grabbing onto your hand. And he says, lest it be said, it was you, Sodom, who blessed me. Worship is not, it, it, it's not about me. It's about recognizing I am here, but you are there. And your hand is extended to me. That as the two meet, I let go and rest and you in your strength, you pull me up, you elevate me. Lest it be said, I pulled myself up. God wants you to be a base camp believer because he wants you to summit. 
humility. Oh, <laughs> I can tell you this much. Last year was one of the hardest years of my life. And I came to the realization at the end of last year, I don't wanna do this because I can't do it. And God's like, you can't do it because you you're doing it in your own strength. Because I is the loudest voice in your life. I is screams. And the problem with I is it doesn't lift you up. It actually pushes you down deeper. This year, let the Lord lead and guide you. Let his grace be all that you're holding on to. Now, I'm not talking about you walk in the opposite direction and your life gets more sin, more sin, more dysfunction. No, in fact, the only way up is to go, Lord, Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. Meaning, when you reflect on yourself, you recognize there is nothing I can do without God, but I don't wanna do it my way. I wanna do it his way. I wanna be elevated and raised up to the glory of God, lifted up. And humility is simply this. I can't do this, Lord, in my own strength. But there's a hand from heaven extended to me that wants me to be elevated from strength to strength. I don't know how you feel today or where you are, but I can tell you this. There is grace extended to you. There is grace extended to you that if you would just humble yourself by going, I can't do this myself. Lord, I can't, I can't be a great husband, a great wife, a great father, a great employee, a great boss, a great anything. In my own strength, I just mess everything up. I takes over. <laughs> and when the I takes over, it's a disaster. Remember Peter? Hey, Jesus, if they all bail, I'll be the one. I'll be the one to stand for you. All these jokers, all these followers, John, you so loved, you so loved. Yes, great, good for you. Mr. I'm so loved. I'm the one who will make a difference for you, Jesus. I'm the brave, I'm the bold, I'm the one who'll cut off the ear. If everyone runs, I will stand. Jesus says, okay, you want to do what? You, I. Within the next 24 hours, you will deny me three times. Your flesh will fail as the greatest failure of modern day time. You'll be the ultimate poster child for in your own strength you fail. But there's grace extended. After Peter's failure, Jesus restores him. He says, now can we do this together? You know what together means? I'm leading you. I'm leading you. You know, Jesus says to Peter, hey, how much do you love me? Uh, this, no, how much do you love me? Uh, uh, quite a bit. Peter, tell me the truth. Nothing. I kind of like you, maybe. Great. Now you can lead. You got nothing to boast in of yourself. God is calling you higher, but it's the simplicity of recognizing, let him lead you. Let him lead you. Hey, I'm just at base camp. Awesome. The next camp higher is ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to let redemption close out the service right now. I want to ask everyone in this place this. We're just going to take a moment, church, and we're just going to reflect on that. I'm going to ask the band to come up, and we're just going to have a moment with the Lord because I believe that it's a word for us at this time to truly reflect on, Lord, where do I need to go back to base camp? Where, where do I need to be able to humble myself and just allow you to do some stuff in me? So I'm gonna ask us just to bow our heads, close our eyes. It's a moment where we can just engage with Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and you would begin to speak to us about what needs to take place in our heart at this moment, at this time.
Cause I thought it was over Held hostage to my shame But you take my graveyard And turn it to graves Now I live in freedom I'm walking in your light And I will sing a new song Christ brought me to life Oh, I will sing a new song Christ brought me to life And in a moment Everything can change In a moment Miracles are made And there is power every eye remains closed and every head is bowed, there is a moment where your life can change right now. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment. Whether you're watching us online or whether you're in this building, there is a moment right now where Jesus is reaching down and He's giving us the opportunity to respond to His gift of salvation, to His gift of forgiveness. And if that is you, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment. A moment where everything can change. The only thing that is required in this moment is to say yes to what Jesus has done. And what he did was he reached down into our, our shame, into our sin. He reached down into a place that we could not help ourselves. And he grabbed us. And he has given us the opportunity to be loved, to be forgiven, to have a brand new start. And if that is you, this morning, right here, right now, you can receive that. Make it your own. How? The Bible says you do two things. You believe in your heart and you speak what you believe. And I believe that there's faith already in your heart in this moment. And as a church, we're going to help you step in and speak what you believe. It's a very simple prayer and we're going to pray it with you. But we want you to reach out and take the hand of grace. Take the hand of forgiveness and let God's love wash over you this morning. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm going to ask our church family to pray this prayer with us. You already have faith. Speak it out loud together with us. The Bible says you will be saved. Let's say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me in my place so that this morning I can receive life, forgiveness, wholeness in every part of my being. I believe you did it for me and I receive that gift and I make it my own in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer for the very first time, if you're watching us online, just type in the comment section and say, hey, I'm a new believer. If you've done that in the room, we would love to be able to congratulate you and say, hey, that's the best decision you're ever going to make. Because in that moment, you humble yourself and you allow Jesus to pick you up. And so if you're in this room here at Greenstone, we'd love you to go past our new believers table. We've got a gift for you. We'd love to be able to talk with you a little bit about what that means for your life. If you're online, just let us know and we'll make sure that that same material that's available in the room here is available to you online. What a beautiful moment. 
we're going to seal what God wants to do in our hearts through the sharing of communion. If you've never got any of these communion elements, just raise your hand and we'll get them to you. If you're watching us online, just press pause, go and get a cracker and some juice and come back and be a part of this communion moment. And the reason that this moment is so important is because we focus on Jesus. We see what He's done. We see His finished work. And we see His hand reaching down towards us and helping us. And so whatever your need is this morning, see that need met in the cross. Whether you want to remain seated or stand, that's up to you. The, the, the key thing is that we see Jesus. See His finished work. See His provision for our lives this morning. You just peel back that first layer and it gives you access to this wafer. And that speaks to His body that was broken. It speaks to everything that he went through on our behalf. The punishment he received so that we don't have to. Whatever you're trusting God for in this moment, as you partake together, receive what you need. You peel back that next layer, it gives you the juice speaks of his forgiveness, his blood that flowed down from the cross to wash away every single sin. Recognize this morning that if you are in need of forgiveness, he already did it. Just reach out and as you partake, receive that forgiveness afresh. Holy Spirit, we pray that in this moment that you would seal what you are doing in our hearts and in our lives. As we look to Jesus, we thank you that there is an ever-flowing supply for everything that we need in our lives. Thank you, Father, for that. And all of God's people said, Amen.